So, first of all, we then have Ellie. And Ellie's background, she's currently writer in residence at Cox University in Istanbul. Um, when I told my um, former writer in residence, Mike Bill Lockton, that Ellis would be here, he sent back an email with capital letters saying, I love Ellie. <laughs> Never actually met her, but she really <laughs> likes her writing. Um, so it's, it's good to know that she could be a writer in residence as well. She's writer in residence in Istanbul. She was born in New York City, and she grew up in New Jersey before she headed off to academia in San Francisco. Her heritage is Turkish and her inclination strongly towards Eastern Rite and culture, which she has worked through in her first magnificent book, The Possessed, Adventures of Russian Books and the People Who Read Them. Described as one of the funniest books ever written about Russian literature or grad school, it has won extravagant but well-deserved praise and was finalist for the 2011 National Book Critics Circle Award. Determined to live her own life in terms of books, preoccupied by the double-ended relationship between literature and the lived experience, believing that out-of-the-way places and literature are never wasted on writers. Ellis' book recounts her adventures studying old Uzbek poetry in Samarkand, a city so deeply imbued with poetry that even the medical treatise is turned there. Of her sentimental literary education, she says she was younger and dumber then, which I don't know about the dumber thing, this outstanding book, along with her clear-eyed, wry, and exact speech, has been a New Yorker, New York Times, and Harper's, amongst others, her witty website, they're all accredited to one of the cleverest and one of the best writers of her generation. Rachel Polonsky in the Literary Review said of her that she scatters her profundity playfully, her prose has an endearing, distinctively American kind of unabashed, oddball smartness about it. She is intellectual without being pretentious, satirical but never cynical, and disarmingly mock heroic on a question of her own life plot. So the plot here thickens this afternoon as Cook presents Ellis Beckman. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm so happy to be here. It's my first time in Ireland, and I can't imagine happier circumstances. Um, I'm going to read to you a little bit from my, my book, The Possessed Adventures with Russian Books and the People Who Read Them. Uh, so there's, I'm going to read a tiny bit from the introduction. Oh, first I'm going to look at the time so I don't yammer on all day. Okay. Um, so the introduction, is, it, it's about how uh, I started out life wanting to be a writer. Uh, and then for, for various reasons, I thought that if you wanted to be a writer, you shouldn't read too many books because... Uh, it was, it was kind of part of the cultural zeitgeist of America at the, the time I was growing up, which I blame on the Cold War. There was this idea that uh, in Russia, people read books and they, they memorize and they, um, they're not original, they're not creative, uh, they're not capable of creativity and, and original thought. Uh, and, and at the same time, there was this kind of idea that you shouldn't study literature um, to become a writer because, because then you would fall into theory and uh, and it would make you destructive and you wouldn't be able to produce anything. So, so the introduction is about how I got over both of those ideas and decided that the, the best way to become a writer was sort of to pursue uh, books in the world. Also, I mean, it's, well, well you know, it's a very sad story. I'm, I'm gonna read you <laughs> a, a part, of the part about how I ended up in, in, um, in graduate school. Uh, Which was, which was really for money, because uh, it, it, it was, I wanted to write a novel, but I, I, I didn't have the cash. So I, if you, go to, if you go enter a PhD program, you get a small stipend, so you can, um, so yeah. So I did that, and I thought I was gonna stay there a year or two, and uh, after I'd written my novel, of course, I would leave. That was the plan, um, which that's not how it happened. Uh, okay. This isn't to say that graduate school was one long walk in the park, especially not at first, I did have the good fortune to strike an immediate friendship with one of my classmates, Luba, a Russian emigre who had grown up in Tashkent. I feel very lucky to have met such a wonderful person at that delicate point in my career. In between sessions of a seminar on an obscure school of 1920s Russian filmmakers known for their eccentric use of circus paraphernalia and human-sized rubber mannequins, we would take long walks around the graduate student housing complex, invariably getting lost and once even falling into some kind of a ditch. <laughs> Between classes, conferences, teaching, and endless lunches, it became clear to me that I wasn't going to get anything but term papers written at Stanford. Oh yeah, that's where this is happening, in California. 
uh, at the end of the year, I filed for a leave of absence and moved to San Francisco, where, between odd jobs, I wrote a great deal. Nonetheless, the result somehow wasn't a novel. It didn't have a beginning or an end. It didn't seem to be telling any particular story. This was surprising and difficult for me to understand. It had occurred to me to worry in advance about writer's block, but the production of a huge non-novel just was not a possibility I had anticipated. <laughs> I was thinking over the problem on the evening of September 13th, 2001, while running to the Golden Gate Bridge, when I tripped over some kind of plastic barrier, erected, I later learned, with the intention of protecting the bridge from terrorists. I think I'm the only person who the bridge was protected from <laughs> by that barrier. So, uh, some other joggers helped me to my feet. My arm felt very strange. I walked to the nearest hospital and spent some hours in the waiting room where a ceiling-mounted television showed endless footage of bodies being excavated from the World Trade Center. Eventually, I was admitted to the emergency room where doctors removed the gravel from my knees, x-rayed my arm, informed me that my elbow was broken, and outfitted me with a cast and sling. The bill came to $1,700. This experience caused me to take a cold, hard look at the direction my life was headed. What was I doing running around this world, a place about which I clearly understood nothing, with no health insurance and no real job, writing an endless novel about God knows what? <laughs> a week later, the department head called and asked if I wanted to return to Stanford. I said yes. That's when I was sucked in deeper than I ever expected. The title of this book is borrowed from Dostoevsky's weirdest novel, The Demons, formerly translated as The Possessed, which narrates the descent into madness of a circle of intellectuals in a remote Russian province, a situation analogous in certain ways to my own experiences in graduate school. <laughs> when I reemerged into the real world, I thought differently about lots of things. I no longer believed that novels should or could be inspired only by life and not by other novels. I knew now that this belief was itself a novelistic device, that it was precisely the European novel tradition after Don Quixote that gave rise to the idea of the falseness and sterility of literature, its disconnect with real life and real education. In fact, this idea wasn't unambiguously present in Don Quixote. Consider the famous Book Inquisition episode in which the priest and barber attempt to cure the knight's madness by purging his library. The received version of this episode is that Quixote's friends burn most of his books, mirroring the received image of Don Quixote that romances are stupid and dangerous. But if you actually keep count, you see that of 30 books mentioned during the Inquisition, only 14 are consigned to the flames, while another 14 are officially pardoned. There's also exactly two that are uh, put in some kind of purgatory. One is, one is sentenced to being put in a deep well, and the other one is giving a, given a dose of rhubarb, which was a, was a laxative um, because it was overrun. Uh, so there's exactly two that are, that are in this kind of limbo, too. This equivalence reflects the balance between life and literature in the plot, which, as Foucault observed, consists of a diligent search over the entire surface of the earth for forms that will prove that what the books say is true. Quixote's adventures in the world, his friendship with Sancho Panza, his reconciling of sundered lovers, the entertainment he affords to countless bored Spaniards, all this, no less than the damage he causes, comes from his determination to experience life in terms of his favorite books, to bring books into the field. Don Quixote could only have been written by someone who really loved chivalric romances, really wanted his life to resemble them more closely, and understood just what it would cost. Thinking about Don Quixote, I began to wonder about other possible methods for bringing one's life closer to one's favorite books. From Cervantes onward, the method of the novel has typically been imitation. The characters try to resemble the characters in the books they find meaningful. But what if you tried something different? What if you tried study instead of imitation and metonymy instead of metaphor? What if, instead of going out into your neighborhood pretending to be the hero of Amadis of Gaul, you instead devoted your life to the mystery of its original author, learned Spanish and Portuguese, tracked down all the scholarly experts, figured out where Gaul is, uh, most scholars think Wales or Brittany might be near here. Uh, what, what if you did it all yourself instead of inventing a fictional character? What if you wrote a book and it was all true? What if you read Balzac's Lost Illusions and instead of moving to New York, living in a garret, self-publishing your poetry, writing book reviews, and having love affairs, instead of living your own version of Lost Illusions in order to someday write the same novel for 21st century America, what if instead you went to Balzac's house and met at Hanska's estate, read every word he ever wrote, dug up every last thing you could about him, and then started writing? <laughs> so that's the general idea of the book. 
The International Tolstoy Conference lasts four days and is held on the grounds of Yasnaya Polyana, the estate where Tolstoy was born, lived most of his life, wrote War and Peace and Anna Karenina, and is buried. In the summer after my fourth year at Stanford, I presented part of a dissertation chapter at this conference. At the time, the department awarded two kinds of international travel grants. So, uh, getting money is a, is a recurring theme in this room. <laughs> uh, $1,000 for presenting a conference paper or $2,500 for field research. My needs clearly fell into the first category, but with an extra $1,500 on the line, I decided to have a go at writing a field research proposal. Surely there was some mystery that could only be solved at Tolstoy's house. I rode my bicycle through blinding sunshine to the library and spent several hours shut up in my refrigerated fluorescent lit carol with a copy of Henri Troyat's 700 page Tolstoy. I read with particular interest the final chapters, Last Will and Testament and Flight. Finally, I went back inside and plugged in my laptop. Quote, Tolstoy died in November 1910 at the provincial train station of Astapova, only what can only be described as strange circumstances, I typed. The strangeness of these circumstances was immediately assimilated into the broader context of Tolstoy's life and work. After all, had anyone really expected the author of The Death of Ivan Ilyich to drop dead quietly in some dark corner? And so, a death was taken for granted that in fact merited closer examination. I was rather pleased by my proposal, which I titled, Did Tolstoy Die of Natural Causes or Was He Murdered? <laughs> <laughs> a forensic investigation, and which included a historical survey of individuals who had motive and opportunity to affect Tolstoy's death. <laughs> Arguably Russia's most controversial public figure, Tolstoy was not without powerful enemies. More letters threatening my life, he noted in 1897, when his defense of the Ducha Borsh sect drew loud protests from the Orthodox Church and from Tsar Nikolai, who even had Tolstoy followed by the secret police. As is often the case, Tolstoy's enemies were no more alarming than his so-called friends. For instance, the pilgrims who swarmed Yasnaya Polyana, a shifting mass of philosophers, drifters, and desperados, collectively referred to by the domestic staff as the Dark Ones. These volatile characters included a morphine addict who had written a mathematical proof of Christianity, a barefoot Swedish septuagenarian who preached sartorial simplicity and who eventually had to be driven away because he was beginning to be indecent, and a blind old believer who pursued the sound of Tolstoy's footsteps shouting, liar, hypocrite. I feel like that's how you know you made it as a writer. You know? <laughs> Meanwhile, within the family circle, Tolstoy's will was the subject of bitter contention. You are certainly my most entertaining student, said my advisor when I told her about my theory. Tolstoy murdered, ha. Huh? The man was 82 years old with a history of stroke. <laughs> That's exactly what would make it the perfect crime, I explained. <laughs> the department was not convinced. They did, however, give me the $1,000 grant to present my paper. On the day of my flight to Moscow, I was late to the airport. Check-in was already closed. Although I was eventually let onto the plane, my suitcase was not, and it subsequently vanished altogether from the Aeroflot informational system. <laughs> Air travel is like death. Everything is taken from me. <laughs> because there are no clothing stores in Yasnaya Polyana, I was obliged to wear, for four days of the conference, the same clothes in which I had traveled, flip-flops, sweatpants, and a flannel shirt. <laughs> I had hoped to sleep on the plane and had dressed accordingly, some international Tolstoy scholars assumed that I was a Tolstoyan, that, like Tolstoy and his followers, I had taken a vow to walk around in sandals <laughs> all day and all night. They were some 25 in number, the international Tolstoy scholars. Together, between talks on Tolstoy, we wandered through Tolstoy's house and Tolstoy's garden, sat on Tolstoy's favorite bench, admired Tolstoy's beehives, marveled at Tolstoy's favorite hut, and avoided the vitiated descendants of Tolstoy's favorite geese. One of these almost feral creatures had bitten a cultural semiotician. <laughs> Every morning I called Erreflot to ask about my suitcase. Oh, it's you, sighed the clerk. <laughs> yes, I have your request right here. Address Yasne Paliana, Tolstoy's house. When we find a suitcase, we will send it to you. In the meantime, are you familiar with our Russian phrase, resignation of the soul? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.